get get moving here. So uh, just welcome to everybody watching on Facebook and everybody on our Zoom today. I'm going to just before I formally introduce our speaker today, I'm going to run through uh, a few of our introductory slides. We always begin our webinar with our land acknowledgement that Crow Canyon Archaeological Center acknowledges the Pueblo, Ute, Paiute, Diné, and Hickory Apache people on whose traditional homelands our campus sits. Our mission-related work would not be possible without Indigenous people in the past, present, and future. We respectfully recognize and honor ancestral and descendant Indigenous communities for their contributions to all humankind. Crow Canyon is grateful to all Indigenous people and supports the preservation and protection of cultural traditions, ancestral connections, and sacred lands. We think it's really important to do this acknowledgement, but it is not just a static uh, static words or static acknowledgement of the land that we sit on. We are absolutely committed to um, Indigenous social justice and to the partners who make our work possible here. Um, we have some programs, uh, speaking of our Indigenous partners, uh, that I hope you might consider. Um, uh, a huge thank you for supporting the webinar series. We are just really incredibly grateful uh, that you support us and we've been able to keep this going even though the pandemic is uh, has abated. We have our Pueblo Weaving Workshop. There are still seats uh, available on that. You would come out and stay on campus. There are field trips uh, to amazing sites that people don't normally have access to. Uh, and we have our Native Scholars and uh, Ben Bellarado from, from Crow Canyon here who will be um, teaching you about weaving and teaching you to weave yourself. Brand new, just dropped the Uinta Fremont Pathways program. Uh, this will be on the road. This will be based out of Vernal, Utah. So you won't be on campus for, for this one, but you will have us with you. You'll have me with you and uh, our um, uh, longtime employee, Rebecca Hammond, Ute tribal member and cultural specialist, and Carol Patterson, who's an expert in Ute rock art. So th this will be an incredible trip too. So still seats available on both of these. And I think there's another um, program, a survey program for uh, adults as well on the website. So please take a look at that. We're pretty familiar with Zoom. The one thing uh, to maybe remember is try to put your questions in the Q&A tab instead of the chat so that they don't get lost. If your Zoom is giving you trouble, jump on over to our live stream on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for uh, any webinars you might have missed. Uh, we have some uh, amazing ones coming up, of course. Um, we, I am really looking forward to hearing from Danielle Lucero. The impacts of tribal enrollment on Pueblo women's reproductive decisions should be incredible. Uh, that's next week. And the week after that, our longtime partner from Poland, um, uh, we'll be talking about uh, ancestral Pueblo, historic Ute, and Euro-American rock art and historical inscriptions in Canyons of the Ancients. Uh, this is our friend Radek and, and his digital work and reconstructions uh, of rock art really are spectacular. So please come and check that out too. Uh, without further ado, I am so happy uh, to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Fine. Uh, or Kathy, depending on how well you know her, who is a professor emeritus of anthropology, gender, women's studies at Fort Lewis College um, over here in, Dur in Durango, has spent a lot of her ethnographic field research in Ecuador uh, for many, many decades and has done NAGPRA work uh, in Ecuador. Uh, she has served at, during her Fort Lewis career. She served until retirement as the chair of the NAGPRA committee and as a NAGPRA liaison. Uh, her bio of accomplishments is really too long to read here, but I wanted to point out that she has many books that you can check out, um, including a very popular one, Grave Injustice, the American Indian Repatriation Movement and NAGPRA. So um, please check that out. And she also has a forthcoming Spanish translation of her book, Urban Mountain Beings History indigeneity and geographies of time in Quito, Ecuador, which I am looking forward to reading the English version, which I have not read yet. Um, and I think we will hear some more about her upcoming projects as well. So welcome, Kathy, I am going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, I'm trying to share, okay, I'll share screen.
Um, this isn't right. Looks like we're a few slides ahead in your PowerPoint there. Yeah, it jumped ahead. Okay. Okay. Are you there? Am I there? I don't have anything coming through just yet. Well, why don't have you hit that share screen button and follow the pop-up um, one more time. Okay, that's... Okay. There we go. Perfect, we can see you now. Okay. Well, hello everyone. I'm really pleased to be here. I'm real honored to have been invited. And I'm sort of a wordy person. I talk a lot. And so things will come up throughout the course of this. So I won't chit chat too much right now. I'll just go right into it. But I'll just say that in the title slide here, um, I, some of the research that I do on NAGPRA I've been doing for a long time involves the idea of frictions, which are um, kind of necessary parts of doing um, critical work in the social sciences and in the legal realm. And then the idea of reconciliation and especially irreconciliation. So I'll get to that to the end of the talk, but um, that's, that's where we're going to be headed in the talk. Um, and this is the flow of the talk. So I'll say a little bit, uh, number one, so by way of introduction, introducing me and the point of this talk. And then the talk will go through these topics. What is NAGPRA? Where is it headed? What's it accomplished? what positive and progressive changes have been made, and then the work ahead. And this is really the bulk of my talk here is that there's still a whole lot of work left to do despite the, the successes, um, the qualified successes of the past three plus decades. Uh, first of all, I'd like to speak in remembrance of some people I worked with in doing NAG for compliance who are no longer with us. You may know some of these individuals and um, they're still very present with the work we do and the inspiration they gave. And then, uh, you know, usually people put their gratitude slides at the end of their talk when they've run out of time and they didn't even get to the end of their talk. And, and I want to make sure that I have my gratitude up front uh, to Crow Canyon. Uh, Taylor's worked with me just quite a bit to make this work. Everybody here today, I'm, I'm just grateful for all of you here. Um, these individuals, some of them you know, a lot of them in here, and I want to give a call out to Bob Purcell, who's the director of the Half and Raffer Museum at Brown, who suggested that maybe I could give a talk, and so I'm I'm grateful to all these to all y'all, all y'all. Um, I'm also grateful to the tribes I've worked with when I was NAGPRA compliance officer at Fort Lewis College. These are the 26 consulting tribes and pueblos that Fort Lewis College, as well as Mesa Verde works with, and they're part of the 48 uh, state of Colorado consulting tribal nations. So in doing a Form B compliance effort, I also worked with and uh, solicited support from these tribes, plus Fort Peck, Assiniboine, and Sioux, whose tribal council has said that they do recognize Colorado as ancestral to their people. Okay, so I'm just gonna give you a little bit of position background, and that means, who am I? Why am I talking to you? I'm, my name's Kathy Findare. I'm from Indianapolis. My dad was a high school coach. Um, and my mom's family, her entire family are from a little village called Exino Nero in northern Greece, and they were refugees from Greek Macedonia. <clears throat> I was trained at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign in ethnographic inquiry, the history of anthropology from a critical perspective and a decolonized perspective was very important to my work. Um, and I was hired at Fort Lewis College back in the day. Um, to teach South American anthropology. And NAGPRA just kind of fell in my lap when I was department chair the first time in 1994. And what that meant is that I had to develop new areas of knowledge, listening, relationships, and practice. And I was obliged and pleased to do so, actually, because the work I do is situated on Native people's lands and territories and their histories, both in North and South America. And so um, me getting up to speed with what I had to do for NAGPRA was worth the effort. So I was co-PI of the two NAGPRA grants that Fort Lewis College received in the 90s and then 2017. 
the first one with Phil Duke and the second with Shelby Tisdale. I was chair of the NAGPRA committee and I was the college compliance liaison until 2022. Um, I have two books out um, that Liz mentioned um, and I'm prepared. So when this one's out, the 2023, the translation of urban mountain beans on the history of indigeneity, the historicity of it, um, I'm, I have an agreement with University of Nebraska to do a revised edition of Grave Injustice. And um, so this talk is part of my background work to try to get up to speed on that. Um, and the book was mentioned, if any of you've read the new novel, Warrior Girl Unearthed by Angeline Booley, the Ojibwe scholar, um, they, she talks about grave injustice as part of the novel. I was real tickled. Okay, um, I, so I've had, I've, I got up to speed. I learned something about NAGPRA in two places. One was the classroom, which kind of the culmination of that in some ways was an honors course in 2015. And these students were just critical to my education. Um, and here's a couple quotes from two of these students, Tusi Stauffer, who is a Yupik author. Um, and I don't need to read this to you out loud, but how this country's built upon bones. Um, and uh, she was very emotional, very decisive about this because of what her family had gone through with Cal Berkeley to try to get their ancestral remains home. And then Stephanie left hand um, always talked about NAGPRA as being part of the uh, sovereignty. And then I worked with consultation with tribal consultants during the time that Shelby Tisdale and I managed the NAGPRA grant at Fort Lewis College. And this is just one slide from that experience with Mr. Presley Haskey. You probably all know Octavia Siotawa and Mr. Kwam. Um, who's no longer with us. But I'm not gonna talk about Fort Lewis. I'm gonna talk more generally about NAGPRA and where it's headed after 33 years, first of all. So here's the statute. And for those of you, I wanted to give a little bit of background for those of you who may not be familiar with NAGPRA, but any institution that's ever received any kind of federal funding of any kind, whether it's for a chemistry lab or whatever, is a, considered a federal museum under the law. Um, the law pertains only to the United States, but it's connected to waves of indigenous resistance and survivance, which is a, a, a term that really refers to active sorts of ongoing resistance. But not all museums have demonstrated the institutional will to comply. So we have decades of delays. There's still a whole lot of work to be done. And part of the point of this talk is in the final line here that NAGPRA work needs to be considered as part of broader institutional work addressing Native American human rights, sovereignty, decolonization, reparations, and reconciliation. How do we do that? It's tough, and I don't have answers, just suggestions. So central features of NAGPRA, the main documentation of collections, consultation with Native Americans, and repatriation of culturally affiliated uh, these categories, sacred objects, objects of cultural patrimony, and so forth. <clears throat> um, and there's also a federal process for assigning disposition to non-culturally affiliated Native American human remains. And I, it, this actually took up a lot of my time as the NAGPRA liaison for Fort Lewis. That's where I had to get, I had to get letters of support from the 48 <clears throat> Colorado tribes so that we could have disposition jointly to the Ute tribes. Um, there are cr criminal and civil penalties under NAGPRA. And finally, um, finally, the U.S. government has hired a full-time person to be in charge of doing that work, which is wonderful news. <clears throat> Anyone can file a complaint or lawsuit regarding a perceived NAGPRA violation. But still, not too much has been um, <clears throat> levied against people who are not in compliance. This is important to me. Cultural affiliation determinations are based on 10 equally weighted factors. And these equally weighted factors, none of them takes precedence over any other. And this means that this is part of the point of my whole talk and what I think about with NAGPRA is that this is a holistic, broad enterprise. This isn't just archeology. span It's not just bioanthropology. <clears throat> it's not just law. It is this world of all sorts of information comes into play in determining cultural affiliation in order to affect repatriation. And other information or expert opinion, uh, that's 
primarily knowledge from descendant communities. That's what's really central. So cultural affiliation decisions come down to this wisdom from descendant communities. They're cultural, social, functional, relational, intentional, which is all part of indigenous epistemology and axiology. Um, and so a NAGPRA authority who gets to say what about cultural affiliation? It's not hierarchical where archaeology is at the top and then bioanthropology and then museum professionals. You've got to have that information, but they're not the sole authorities. Social sciences and humanities are also necessary because we have to look at history and we have to contextualize the debates about history, identity, cultural affiliation, and human rights. Um, and NAGPRA is also, a lot of people say, well, it's just about politics. It's just religious fundamentalism. Um, no, it's a federal response to ongoing historical um, and cultural circumstances. And I'm not going to read all these, but there's still, some say Indian wars are still going on in the United States of America. Dehumanization, continued looting, theft, commodification, and appropriation of indigenous cultures, bodies, and knowledge, thoughtless academic research, um, and ignorance about Native people's histories. I've been talking with one of my former students, Chance Ward, and about his uh, work he's been doing as a graduate student at University of Colorado Boulder. And here all of these students have come in to do museum work and repatriation work, some of them, and he's had to educate them. They haven't even heard of NAGPRA. So we have a lot of work left to do. Um, and Suzanne Harjo, who's one of the leaders in, uh, in getting the NAGPRA law passed, said native peoples, this was just key, they're not cultural resources. We are not cultural resources that fall under cultural resource management laws. And yet until the 1990s, this is what the United States, you go out traveling and see the USA in your Chevrolet, you could go to uh, burial sites for amusement and even dig up um, graves. So what are some of the accomplishments since the statute was passed in 1990? And the statute is based on Native American activism. This didn't just come about, it wasn't imposed by Washington. This were decades and decades of uh, Native American work to uh, have their alienated objects and bodies and knowledge repatriated. And much of that went into the NAGPRA statute. So what has been accomplished since 1990? Well, 92%, um, you can read through this, but 92% of those human remains and, and objects in collections that have completed, fully completed the NAGPRA process, um, the ones that have been uh, designated as knowing what cultural affiliation is on the basis of tribal consultation have completed the process. That sounds pretty good. 1.86 million associated funerary objects have been transferred uh, with human remains. 31% of museums have resolved all their Ameri resolved all the uh, control of, and then you start going, oh, 31%, wait a minute, that's not a very good uh, statistic after three decades. Um, we've got some repatriations of AFO, of UFOs, unassociated funerary objects, 59 thousand dollars has been collected in civil penalties and 56 million has been awarded NAGPRA grants. So there's some progress there. Um, this year, and this is from the most recent uh, report from the National NAGPRA Program Office, they published 250 notices in the Federal Register. We had They had 10 review committee meetings. NAGPRA activity increased and so the human remains that went through what are called the regulatory process grew by 19%. The NAGPRA collections increased in, in terms of the reporting, not the amassing of information. Those reported, however, and, um, and then the funding increased. So that is viewed in some ways as positive. Um, and then here's some more statistics. So for about 71%, of what has been reported and seen as culturally affiliated, the process is complete, meaning the paperwork is done and public notice has been made, but it doesn't necessarily mean they have been reburied or repatriated. Um, and I'll get back to that in a second. And there are other positive changes since the 1990s. 
lots of NAGPRA communities of practice have sprung up. Anna Mahdi spearheaded one from University of Denver from a museum's grant, and it's been extraordinary. That grant just ended, but she still leads these meetings we have every two, every um, every other week. Um, back when I started doing NAGPRA in the 90s, it was you were in a hole, nobody to talk to, nobody to consult with, um, except Native people which was wonderful, but they were also isolated. There were no ways that we could connect with each other. So all of this kind of stuff has happened. More attention in the press. So recently ProPublica uh, reported on uh, what has been done and what still needs to be done with NAGPRA. And NAGPRA has been, discussion has been expanded into sound recordings and archives and so forth. There is also right now proposed new regulations. So these new regulations that are supposed to come out, they were supposed to come out in March, they're still not out, but these are gonna uh, make it easier for tribes to deal with NAGPRA for tribal nations. More of the burdens of compliance is gonna go on to them. Museums have much greater responsibility to initiate consultation. They're gonna be given deadlines for completion, which they didn't have before. And that term culturally unidentifiable is now going to disappear and become geographically affiliated. Uh, there are uh, organizations that are real opposed to these new regulations. They, again, have that old fear that museums are going to be gutted and so forth, but we'll see. Um, so here's some more statistics here. Um, but what it boils down to is that over 52% of the reported Native American ancestral remains are still held in collections. And as Angeline Booley says in her uh, research for Warrior Girl, just others, she, she took it from the National Park Service, but, but she says it well, there's thousands in some estimate, in some estimate millions, some estimate millions more ancestors in boxes in basements all over the world held by institutions and private collectors. So for instance, what ProPublica, Pro, Pro ProPublica, I always want to pronounce it like it's Spanish, ProPublica reported in terms of compliance records for museums, this is only what has been reported, not what is still held um, in countless numbers. We'll probably never know. Um, and so what they reported also, the 20 largest museum holdings of Native American individuals, um, oops, um, these are the, the, the ones, these are the top 40 and the top five uh, of these institutions, meaning the top five offenders are now subject to congressional inquiries. Cal Berkeley, the top one. <clears throat> now, why why is there foot dragging? Why hasn't this been, why isn't NAGPRA done yet after three decades? Well, problems with the statutes, with the regs, with the federal government, with academic disciplines, with museums, but mostly to me, problems with thinking and, pro and barriers to action at institutions and in human people's minds. So to me, my opinion is that meaningful changes must be cultural and structural, not just statutory and regulatory. In other words, the whole, we all have a responsibility to keep working on change. Um, so the work ahead, um, what else? So lack of funding, lack of time, lack of personnel, lack of analysis to identify structural impediments, Hiring practices, Liz and I were just talking about this. You've got to change the way your organization is structured. You can't just say, oh, let's get some soft money and do a NAGPRA grant and call it good. Um, we have to have discourse. We have to talk about false transparencies. Like, it's all good. We're reporting on what we're doing. We're in. What's underlying that? What sorts of things are going on that still put the whole burden on Native people who are not well paid or paid at all? And what Ray Gould, who's from the Nipmuc Nation, and she runs the Native Studies program at Brown University, she wrote an article saying there's institutions that have institutional will in getting NAGPRA done and institutions that don't. So what is lit, what contributes to getting more a lack of institutional will? 
So one of the things I suggest is that we look at NAGPRA as more than a law or a set of regulations. To me, I'm a cultural anthropologist and NAGPRA is much more than a law. It's a cultural trope. A trope is a dense symbol. So when we talk about NAGPRA, we could be just talking about the law, the statute from 1990, or the statute plus the regulations from 2010, or the statute plus the new regulations, but it's the history of why we have to do this, why this is still going on, why institutions like just recently MIT and Dartmouth are what you're three and a half decades later, you, you, you haven't even hardly begun the process, so you're still violating what needs to be done. Um, successful compliance in these sticky situations means I, analyzing the culture of academic authority and privileges and going back to the idea in the statute that multiple lines of evidence mean multiple forms of knowledge. And this means discourse. Um, also, something that we have to think about with NAGPRA is that, and I've written about when I do my work in South America, indigeneity. Sometimes people try to define indigeneity just in terms of and I'll crudely put this, who is an Indian and who is not? And they get bogged down into blood quantum and tribal membership. But when we're talking about NAGPRA, we're talking about a much broader force, the force of indigeneity, which is global in, na in nature. Um, Clifford Geertz used this term, cultural anthropologist. It frames and guides activities. When the force of indigeneity is present, you, you pay attention to what you're saying and what you're doing and how you're organizing your time and your language and your work, um, because it's very central to doing anything that remotely resembles decolonization. History is really important, and that's why I say that the um, humanities have to be involved in social sciences and getting this work done. Um, we have to look about look at the ways that histories have been carved into social realities and the way that history is constantly being created. It's not just in the past. So NAGPRA compliance needs the wisdom of tribal experience so that we can conduct meaningful ethnographies. Institutions need to look at the past and present nature of, of case ethnographies of how they do repatriation work so that they can create programs of change and maintain vigilance against noncompliance, which is what I call irreconciliation. We're not satisfied and we're not going to be satisfied. We have to main, we have to stay awake. So we also have to look at, it's very useful to look at international repatriation, to look at pre-NAGPRA histories of return. Larry Zimmerman has done a whole lot of work at, on this when he was um, involved with the, um, the Learning NAGPRA project funded by the National Science Foundation. I was just involved uh, with a Philadelphia Orphans Court hearing that has to do with Afro-Philadelphians <clears throat> and the desire to um, move the Morton Cranial Collection into the hands of descendants. And the Winter Grin Foundation has been fund funding project on human remains treatments. This goes beyond the letter of the NAGPRA law. And we can learn from them. We also, you know, this uh, Tuck and Yang's famous article, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, is real important. Uh, decolonization means about, you know, rethinking, reframing, doing land acknowledgements, but what decolonization really is, is the return and restu restitution of territories, ancestral bodies, lost resources, lost belongings, repairing fractured repairing fractured social structures. Decolonization isn't just something you do lip service to. It, it means adopting attitudes and actions also of irreconciliation, which I say is about hope, and I'm really interested in the anthropology of hope. How can we take mistakes and build on it, build on mistakes and, and stay humble and stay, never say it's done, never say the work is done and say, I'm not reconciled to saying NAGPRA's all good and we've decolonized ourselves now, no. Um, and one thing to remember to be more concrete is that NAGPRA is principally, it's an indigenous human rights law. It's not a national preservation or conservation law. 
Um, preservation laws place restrictions on the uses of objects and places and districts of antiquity. And as Tim McEwen says, who's a member of the National NAGPRA Review Committee in his book, um, NAGPRA transfers complete control of certain Native American cultural items to lineal descendants to do with as they see fit. NAGPRA is therefore a form of restorative justice. So we also have to situate NAGPRA within United States Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, Articles 11 and 12. Article 11, Indigenous people have the right to practice and revitalize cultures such as archeological and historical sites and so forth, visual, performing arts and literature. Article 12, um, indigenous peoples have the right to practice, develop, and teach their spiritual and religious traditions and customs, and the right to the repatriation of their human remains. This puts NAGPRA squarely into a human rights law, and a global human rights law. So when I talk about irreconciliation, I'm building from research that's being done on the nature of truth and reconciliation commissions, which were established in Latin America, Canada, South Africa. Um, Canada has, has um, set up a truth and reconciliation commission regarding boarding school um, travesties in that nation. The United States still has to apologize to Native people or set up any kind of truth and reconciliation commission. And to do that means you have to have some of the things that are central to NAGPRA, documentation, what happened to whose bodies, children, belongings, accountability, how do we memorialize? How do we keep correcting the record? How can we make things right, at least partly right through reparations? And how can we, how can institutions change to keep this from happening again? So the frictions of, irreconciliation, an attitude of irreconciliation, um, it's, it's connected to more like resilience is a good concept and it's important, but that's one of those false transparencies. We're going to look at resilience, and as long as we highlight and uh, recognize the resilience of Native people, we're doing the work of, of, of decolonization. Well, not necessarily. I mean, you have to be, strength and resilience are important, but you also have to have active survivance. You have to have active work towards um, the unfinished work that still has to be done. And I've said this before, means never saying we're in full compliance. Maintaining vigilance regarding gaslighting. Uh, these are all things I've experienced in my work with NAGPRA, uh, gaslighting, credentialing, siloing. Um, we're done with NAGPRA. What's your problem? Why do you see it otherwise? It's gaslighting. You must be crazy. Credentialing. You're not an archaeologist. What are you doing? You don't have the right to say anything. You're not a biological anthropologist. And siloing. Um, we're going to keep the knowledge within certain authorized disciplines. Um, so achieving institutional will means um, asking important difficult questions, frictional questions, and not whitewash or erase the past of the institution. Some of these questions, is a museum reactive or is it proactive? Meaning, and Fort Lewis was definitely reactive. You know, I was minding my own business being department chair after I had decided I'm never going to be an archaeologist or a museum worker because I don't like that history. And then it NAGPRA fell in my lap and I had to do it as department chair. But that was a reactive approach. I wasn't being proactive. Um, do institutions have a retentive? We must keep everything attitude. And some of that retention is the idea that someday DNA will be so perfect that we can analyze a human remain and we can tell exactly what tribe, exactly what clan, exactly you know, things that are are all are are not the central piece of identity, which is about knowledge. Um, does it does a, an institution's administration think that compliance is only you let's get some grants and soft money, but we don't have to change our budget. We don't have to change our personnel priorities. Um, does the institution focus only on the letter of the law and ignore the spirit of the law? <clears throat> and I'll talk about that in a second. And does it see itself as off the hook? It's like, well, we're not as big or bad or in trouble like MIT or Berkeley or, or um, <laughs> University of Illinois or whatever. So we're cool. Well, no, nobody's ever cool. Nobody's ever off the hook. 
additional red flags um, and a lot of distorted narratives. Um, and some of this I said before, but fail for Seco and failing to report all holdings and congratulating the institution, congratulating itself for not showing up on ProPublica lists. That's already started. It's like, well, no, you know, you go down the list of who ProPublica call, called out. And I happen to know a couple of institutions that, well, yeah, it says that they're in, they've done their NAGPRA work for what they reported, but they haven't reported everything. They haven't done consultation over everything. Um, failure to include NAGPRA and repatriation with discussions about boarding schools, missing and murdered Indigenous people. NAGPRA is logically connected to these situations. And so to break NAGPRA out, as some institutions do, like we don't want to talk about NAGPRA, we're going to keep that se separate. We'll talk about these other things, though. Um, they're all connected. They all should be part of the bigger discussion. Um, accepting symbolic acts as sufficient, again, land acknowledgement, public ceremonials, they may be necessary, but these are what I call ingenuous transparencies. They hide the work that may be necessary in the storage facilities. Um, and so these are things to watch out for when you take an attitude of irreconciliation. What are you looking out for? Uh, it's these kinds of things. So NAGPRA beyond NAGPRA. NAGPRA compliance is more than just following the letter of the law. You have to have institutional conversations about racism, reciprocity, and reparations. And to that, uh, add repatriation or rematriation, as some, some tribes prefer this term because of their um, ancestral legacies and, and the ways that they um, kinship rights are passed. Um, and again, I'll add this, as most NAGPRA practitioners are women, attention to aspects of gender intersection and inequality is a must. And uh, this is something that hasn't been talked about very much. Um, I asked Melanie O'Brien, who is the director of the National NAGPRA office, she's the manager, and I said, "Are you? do you work overwhelmingly with women? Because this conference in June was mostly women. There were only like four men there. And she goes, overwhelmingly women are doing this work. Well, how does that fit into other issues? <clears throat> so the spirit of NAGPRA, and I'll come to a close here nearly, spirit of NAGPRA, when we talk about the spirit, and there are many practitioners or people involved in NAGPRA who hate that. It's like, it's about the law. We shouldn't be talking about anything, but just what's in the statute. But it means aligning an institution's mission with the most powerful United States Native American human rights law. NAGPRA, um, addressed problems with the American Indian Religious Freedom Act in part of 1978, where that law never worked very well because it required natives to give up privacy in claiming um, uh, uh, their rights to sacred lands and, and places. Um, so tribal NAGPRA consultations have always been more about stri than strict legalities. Tribal nation consultants have asked for museum tours. They've been curious about what's taught in classes. They were like that in the 90s at Fort Lewis. You know, when I was leading re, um, consultation in 1996, the first thing, it's like, what do you guys teach? What's on the syllabus? What do you talk about our culture? Take us around campus. Show us where pottery is on display. Um, and so collaborations with institutions like Crow Canyon um, th this is the new wave. This is the kind of thing that we have to do to get beyond strict legalities. Um, and this is humanization. This is a kind of humanization strategy. To use respectful terminology to hire Native practitioners and allies whenever possible and find ways to reduce asymmetry between Native peoples, descendant communities, and institutions. This means a lot of conversation, a lot of work, a lot of visitation of the way an, an institution structures, all this kind of work. So final suggestions I have, a couple of them, two of them really. First one is to take emotion seriously. NAGPRA is extremely emotional. Um, I wrote a, a chapter of a book um, where I talk about the chap the title of the chapter is Mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, Museums and NAGPRA. NAGPRA work is hard. I've never known NAGPRA 
practitioners to not break down and cry periodically because this work is so hard and it's so emotional and it is about mourning. And so um, I advise those of you who do, do NAGPRA work, don't let yourself be silenced or pushed away from the work because it's, you're being told you're irrational, you're non-expert, you're too emotional. Emotions are part of relationality. The expression of emotions connects you to other people and relationships are central to Native American philosophies and um, practice. Um, and then again, I'll just repeat this, having an attitude of irreconciliation, it doesn't mean like you're, you're saying this will never, it's hopeless, we'll never get this done. No, it means keep a sharp eye on ongoing perpetrations, if you want to use that word. What attitudes, practices, coursework, field schools, museum exhibits contribute to retentive or non-repatriation practices? And this may be under the radar. But what's important is to be to develop your own discourse communities that are institutional, maybe people working across departments, across areas who can converse with each other and say, um, I, I'm not. I hope you don't think I'm crazy, but I had this feeling that so-and-so in this branch of the administration was just blowing me off when I was talking about, you know, you have to have somebody to talk to, you have to build those connections. Um, so I say stay vigilant, stay hopeful, stay aware, stay dedicated, stay listening. And, um, you know, I could have talked about any one of these things. I hope I didn't talk too quickly, but I wanted to leave time for questions and answers. Um, so thank you. Wow, that was just spectacular. I, I hope no one else in the audience has any questions because I have all, all sorts of things to talk about. And I think that uh, that you need to come over and visit so that we can uh, spend some spend some concentrated time going through this again, and I would love it if you would share your PowerPoint so that I can ask some more. Oh, um, course, yeah. Oh my gosh! I mean, so many things. I, I uh, partly why I'm I'm so excited is because this is what we've been talking about really intensively for. Uh, you know, a few years now at Crow Canyon um, and really intensively just in the last year and particularly um, uh, this year in 2023, our, we had our, uh, we had a, a, a wonderful session at the essays that, that Dr. Susan Ryan organized mm -hmm. that was very intensively um, focused on well, what we perceive to be the the new the trajectories and the discipline of anthropology uh, that are um, uh, that exemplify where you want to go, that we want to help help to operationalize and and uh, just I suppose some some things uh, that that in the end of your presentation that were just so impactful is. Um, the the self self congratulatory performances. Why why would that ever be a a good idea? I suppose is is uh, is difficult to to get around the the devaluing of of sort of of humility and acknowledgement of your your whether it's witting or unwitting participation in a system that hurts people. So I I don't know if in any of your of your uh, discussions, if if you had a sense of uh, that just fear, right? That's or uh, um, cowardice that's that's driving that kind of behavior. Well, you know, a lot of it is people's good intentions and goodwill. And when I criticize or anything sounds critical, these are things I too have done plenty of. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and didn't think about it. You know, you need it's it change is slow and it's incremental. And I was very fortunate to teach for three decades at Fort Lewis College, where my classes would often have half or more of the students, Native Americans from many different tribal nations. And I get called out all the time. It's a great thing for an anthropologist to work with Native people because they've very they've transformed the discipline of anthropology almost completely in many ways, as well as feminist, African-American abolitionist thinkers and so forth. But when an institution 
realize that something's important. So for instance, um, uh, land acknowledgements, and there's a lot of discussion, the American Anthropological Association Organization of the um, Indigenous, Indigenous Anthropologists Organization, they've had a strong discussion. Many of them do not like land acknowledgements and they don't like the fact that native people are usually singled out to give those. And they say, then what happens from that? Nothing happens from that. And my point of view is that I think they do less harm than good, but they are not sufficient. I think a land acknowledgement is something I think we should all acknowledge um, but it's not, and when it becomes rote, like we're going to have the landing now, we're going to do that. But, you know, I gave a talk oh, in 2020 at Alabama, Birmingham as a visiting scholar, and I prepared a land acknowledgement statement for that area of Birmingham. And um, most of the people in the audience had never heard at that time of a land acknowledgement. They didn't know what I was doing. And so I felt that that was necessary. So I don't know. I mean, I think usually these performances start out as something good, but the irreconciliation aspect is never bask in your laurels. What more needs to be done? And when that's criticized, you step back and go, oh, wait, how, okay, let's talk about this. Thank you for the advice. I don't know. No, the, uh, uh, the, the concept of not being able to, uh, handle criticism is obviously kind of kind of its own topic and and really even in your in the in the topic of of your you know talking about comfort and and discomfort and i think as we have plowed through uh some conversations as as uh groups right of of folks here at Kirkanyan and and one on one and with with partners and we work a lot with the public who don't understand wait Wait, why, why, why are you going this direction? You know, this doesn't make sense to me. Um, uh, the the inability of particularly non-native people to be criticized uh, and even even nicely criticized, which you know many of our indigenous partners are are incredibly gracious, right? Uh, uh, in these circumstances, um, is really I, I kind of wonder if that's that's. That's a key that I, I hope can can we can provide some sort of guidance or education or public education that you will not die by being criticized. Right? Well, by... And, <laughs> yeah, and part of it's a cultural thing. The culture of the United States of America, Anglo-American cultures are very individualistic. They have been from the beginning. That means that explanations get psychologized. And that means right. that when an institution is being criticized, people take it personally. Or, you know, when it's really more a synecdocal thing or metonymic thing, like you're criticizing me, but it's not me personally so much, although sometimes it could be, and I'll, you know, yeah. listen, but it's also what I'm connected to, what I represent. And that's really hard for American Americans, and I'll just talk about Americans, to, to look at systems and how systems mm -hmm. operate. And we're, we're getting less and less training in that because that's seen as subversive. So there are some political trends that are very disturbing because you know that was part of Marxian analysis, which you look at systems and how they work and you look what's below the surface. You don't psychologize everything on the surface. Um, usually when somebody calls somebody else a jerk, it's because they are in competing structural positions and they need to step yeah. back and say, what is it about this organization that puts us at odds? Not that we hate each other. And until right. we can even do that, it's very difficult. People take things personally and they go full blown. And I wanna say something else too, because of the economic condition and where higher ed is in to speak about colleges so forth, um, you know, colleges, need students and they don't need bad PR. And so they want to do the right thing, but they also have to make sure that they're not turning away students. And especially a native serving college like Fort Lewis that has done a remarkable job in staying alive during the pandemic. And I think they've taken a lot of these messages to heart. And I've learned from some of what Fort Lewis has done um, in making some of my own remarks here. No, but huge. Uh, it, it's huge. And I mean, the, the institutions, of course, are 
uh, they're created in this in the in the colonial context. Every every tiny aspect of everything that that happens inside of them is influenced in that manner. And and I I also think about the the huge barriers in not being able to uh, accept not just criticism but also that you can do you can take all of these steps and still be criticized and you're still not going to get congratulated but it's still the right thing to do and and there uh, are reasons to do it and i as we work on cultural competency kind of training and guidance here i think a big a, a huge part of that over and over is the the sort of the white supremacy thinking that around you have a right to be comfortable right all the time and in, in every circumstance and that's uh, I think a real key to to unpacking some of this and to persuading people to take a breath and, and have a different perspective on it. Right. And it's, you know, a lot of NAGPRA practitioners at way too many are in what I would call, especially on a talk again about academic situations, they're in precarious situations of labor. Right. And when you're in a right. precarious labor situation, meaning the other word for that, and the sun just went down for some reason, <laughs> is that, um, that means you could be hired and fired at somebody else's will. And so when people don't have tenure who are in charge of NAGPRA at institutions, they can't oh, wow. speak up in the same way. They can't, you know, and, and nobody ever looks at those sorts of dynamics. It's very difficult. Um, and that's why the voices of practitioners from, from TIPO offices, people like Cassandra Tensio and Terry Knight, the ones I've worked with, and um, Terry Knight has made me cry and he's been right on every time, you know, like one of the people I've learned from and Cassandra as well. And you just keep on moving and you're and the and that's why it's really important. One strategy, a concrete suggestion, is that institutions, whether they be colleges, Crow Canyons, um, or whatever, a museums, is you have a committee that has outside people on the committee, primarily from tribal nations. So it's not all incestuous and somebody cannot be accused, cannot be gaslit from within that institution, makes it more public. Yeah. Well, I better, I'm going to have to graciously accept some criticism if I don't stop monopolizing you because we've got lots of questions coming in. So oh, I'm going to okay. uh, jump in on one from one of our our friends and colleagues, Dr. Susan Markley, who asks if Dr. Fine can talk more about the predominance of women in NAGPRA roles, her opinions on why that is, uh, seems unlikely that there's a similar predominance of women in institutions at decision-making levels. So thank you, Susan. Yeah, I don't have any good answers. It was like I said, I was looking around at the, NA at the NAGPRA community practice meeting last June at Brown University overwhelmingly the room full of women and I was sitting there with Melanie and said is this just a fluke of who got who came to this meeting Melanie you work with everybody in the whole U.S. and all the tribes and it's predominantly women and this is difficult because for many uh, tribal um, uh, protocol men and women need to be working in NAGPRA because women cannot be especially women of childbearing age and so forth cannot be near ancestors for their own safety and so forth and so there's a huge disparity and to my knowledge nobody has looked at it written about it yet and you know it comes hand in hand with pay that's subpar so I just throw right. that there but I'm glad somebody picked up on that because it's kind of a beef I have but I don't know I don't know why except it's the same old crap yep absolutely <laughs> same old crap okay <laughs> let me let me scroll through some of these uh questions oh here's a here's a good one that has popped in uh do you see ways that the news media could be brought in and engaged more in getting information about NAGPRA and these related issues into public discourse great question it is a great question. Um, and I've been interviewed many times and most of what I have to say did not end up in, mus in news articles. Um, Drango Herald has incorrectly reported numerous times on what's going on with NAGPRA. Um, I think ProPublica did a fabulous job. I was interviewed twice at length with them. And so I'm hoping that ProPublica and then connecting with NBC and so forth, that this is a trend that started and that uh, repatriation will be much more in the eye of the press. But it means people writing op-ed articles and people working as citizens to get that out there as well. Great question. 
All right, fantastic. Um, you know, I think this this is a, a more of a semantic question, but I think it's worthwhile uh, uh, towards the ideas that you're discussing. Someone says, thank you uh, for the presentation. Would you please explain a little more about what you mean when you use psychologize as a verb? Oh, well, I'm a cultural anthropologist. <laughs> There's a long history of sociology and anthropology splitting, but it means to take a problem that is institutional or group related and fixate it or find the source of the problem in a single person. It's in their psychology, they're crazy, they're bad, they're, and, and it turns the attention away. And this is something that Emile Durkheim, those of you who've studied social anthro, Emile Durkheim was very much interested in other uh, sociologists in getting away from an, uh, so psychology, social psychology still retains that, but we are a psychologizing, we, we want to go to therapists for everything. We think that if we can fix ourselves, the whole world will get fixed. And, you know, it doesn't hurt, but it means we don't look at the way institutions and the, and the internal contradictions of institutions. So like, for instance, the Brazilian government, the, the body of the Brazilian government that was in charge of economic development and mining was under the same umbrella with the, with the organization supposedly protecting uh, FUNAI, Native American rights. And it's like, they're under the same umbrella. That's an institutional contradiction, but it pits mm -hmm. Native people against non-Native people when it's, it's the way the structure is set up. That's what I mean by that. No, absolutely. What what a great what a great explanation. Um, here's one that I think points to uh, your experience in in Ecuador and in other countries. One of our participants asks, um, can you point us towards countries or cultures that have made a stronger uh, effort to address these you know similar kinds of issues? Obviously, NAGPRA only applies in the in the U.S. Um, did they, uh, is there things to learn, learn from them uh, moving forward? Not a lot. Um, <laughs> you know, parts of Australia, um, parts of Canada, areas of Canada have NAGPRA-like um, initiatives, but it's difficult. South America, one of the things when I lectured as a Fulbright person in Ecuador is that repatriation in Latin American context does not mean back to tribal people, it means to the nation state. And so there's still a strong nation state or uh, orientation. Um, I have a colleague who teaches at the University of Padova in Italy, and she does this kind of work. And she told me that some European countries are much more repatriation oriented than others. And just kind of texting me one day, I'm like, what's the best? Who's the worst? And she said, Scotland is one of the best and Italy, her own country is one of the worst. So it has to do with histories of collections and so forth. Right now, Germany is one of the leaders in paying attention when they used to be one of the worst in terms of Indian hobbyism and appropriation. So, but we, being involved internationally, um, and, and then you look at high international situations, I would say the Haida nation of um, is one of the best, you know, they're under Canada, but they're one of the best nations in terms of taking on repatriation and doing it on their own. And I consider them an example for the whole world. That's wonderful. Excellent. Okay. Um, one of our regular uh, uh, attendees, Calvin, uh, has asked uh, kind of about our own state here in Colorado that he's read that the Colorado History Museum has done an exemplary job with NAGPRA um, along with what and how cultural objects are stored in displays. Um, I guess, is, is this your experience with, with Colorado Hist uh, History Colorado as well? And um, are you familiar with, with their collaborative with this or anything we could learn from them? Well, there was an article written a um, long time ago about how Colorado was leading the whole country and what they did. And I think so. And I think with the leadership of Mr. Knight, um, History Colorado getting a state process in place, which isn't the same as NAGPRA, but it, it works with NAGPRA. I think Colorado, um, in terms of a state, um, is is one of the leaders. And from the leadership of people like Sheila Goff and Bridget Ambler at History Colorado and Glynis Echeverria 
uh, who just left. So right now they don't have a nag per person. They're going to be searching for that position later this summer and they've reorganized some. So NAGPRA now won't be under the state archeologist. So they're always thinking and reorganizing. But yeah, I would say that compared to some other states, Colorado has set a good example. And that's a lot of it's the leadership of people, again, like Cassandra Atencio, um, her father, Alden Naranjo, and, and Mr. Knight and others, many others, Garrett Briggs at Southern Ute. Um, so yeah. Wonderful. That's so good. I'm, I'm so happy <laughs> about that. And those amazing people that we, that we work with as well are, are behind a lot of that success. Yeah. Yeah. Since we have one minute left, I'm going to try to group like a handful of questions that have to do with money. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> I know, and it's a ter there's not a good answer to this, but obviously people are kind of talking about um, organizations that seem to drag their feet and say, oh, we don't have the money. There's questions about, is there any money? Does Congress provide, you know, allocate funds uh, to do this? Uh, what can we do about these places that are, are using this in a, as an excuse or as um, a reality? Um, yeah, you know, and, and that was one of the things they passed NAGPRA, but they didn't do anything about the money part, except there's funding for grants. Um, and uh, one thing I'll say is that um, and, and every year when the National Ag Review Committee does its report, the top thing is always, we need more funding, we need more funding. But many more organizations, institutions are providing funding that one can use for NAGPRA compliance. So my advice is be much more creative. So I mentioned before the Winterground Foundation for Anthropological Research um, has now, now it isn't, you just, the only source of funding is not just the National Park Service NAGPRA grants, also, um, the, the National Park Service repatriation grants are non-competitive. If you put together a proposal and it's time to repatriate, it, it doesn't cover the consultation. That's, that's a, a competitive grant. But there's more money out there than one would think. But again, it's, institute. you need to also hammer at the institutions. We have at, I'll just use Fort Lewis College, an office of, for um, disability services, ADA, for Title IX and so forth, never had a funded NAGPRA office ever until almost the last year that I was there. And it, that's outrageous. This is a federal law and, and institutions need to have a, a presence that's funded within the, the, the budget um, the, the, the budget organization of that institution, not say, where are we going to get a grant? Where are we going to get a grant? I mean, NAGPRA is forever. It's never going away. And so institutions need to get with a program. And that means activism, raising your voice. And now it's wonderful because there are these communities of practice all around the country. There's a Colorado one, there's a Southeast one, they're developing one in the North east they're developing one in the northwest and people what part of the thing is people share ideas about funding so get involved in, in one of those organizations wonderful wonderful wow well i want to re respect your time we're a couple minutes over i uh i think uh i tried to type some answers in the chat to to things um that were that were simple since i knew we were running out of time but um Thank you so much, Kathy. Uh, we're likely going to tap you again, either for, uh, for the webinar series or to perhaps come out and have a have a working meeting with our staff. Such amazing work. Thank you so much for everything well, you've done. Thank you. And I want to um, say to people, I've seen that some people are interested in having, I'm pretty open with sharing my PowerPoints or whatever. If people want to email me, um, and ask me and, and converse with me, I'm open to that. I'm either findable at fine underscore k at fortlewis.edu or at findairkathleen at gmail.com. So if you want to contact me, um, we'll talk and I can talk about resources or whatever, because this is not secret. Our voices right. have to connect. This is, so thank you for your interest. Thanks to all of you who could be outside enjoying the weather and you sat around at a computer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a real compliment yes for everyone thank you so much everyone who joined us and thank you kathy and hopefully we will see you soon i hope so too somebody wrote that we make a good tag team you and i so maybe <laughs> I think we can do it again
I and think we should. I think it's pretty fun. I'm sure we could uh, generate all kinds of criticism by getting out there in public together. So thank you so much. All right. Take care, Kathy. Bye. Bye. -bye.